Hi. How is everybody? We good? Can you hear that? Oh, there we go. How are you? Good? It's the last weekend of the year, so they let the music guy preach. Pretty cool. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Stephen Bailey. I'm the new worship pastor here at the Christ Community. Hey, thank you. I'm enjoying being here, but there's three things before I get started that I just need to get out of the way. Number one, this table's too short. <laughs> and I didn't wear my glasses, so I might start doing this. It's because I can't see. I can already hear my mom now. She's going to be like, you didn't stand up straight. I watched you on the TV. You didn't stand up straight. <laughs> second thing is, what was the second thing? Okay, we'll skip the second thing. Third thing, I just moved up here from Texas, so I don't speak very good English. I speak what we call Texan, okay? And so you're going to have to get used to that if you're going to listen to me talk for a little while, okay? Some examples. Number one, what is this? What do you guys call this? A hat? Like a winter hat? A stocking cap? You know what we call these in Texas? A toboggan. Guess who found out the hard way that this isn't a toboggan? <laughs> me. You should have seen me at the shoe store in the mall trying to get the guy to tell me how much the red, white, and blue Under Armour toboggan is. How much is it? <sighs> Secondly, up here you guys say you all. I don't say you all. I say y'all. That's you and all combined, okay? <laughs> but... Y'all is only good for a crowd of up to five people. Once we get a crowd this size, it's all y'all, and that stands for all you all, and that makes no sense at all. <laughs> so go figure that. That's Texan for you. If you want to take a lesson, I'll give you some. The first two are free. How to speak Texan. Oh, I remember the second thing I was going to tell you. I don't mind if you call me Bailey. Okay? <laughs> Everybody's like, do you like that? I don't, I don't care. So call me Stephen, call me Bailey. It's fine. Whatever. You know, when I moved up here, I've got to be honest with you, I had these expectations in my mind on how different it was going to be up here. I mean, let's think about it for a second. Texas is known for her politically conservative views, right? Massachusetts, eh, not so much, right? So there's a few things that I had to get used to, like in society around here, especially when driving. People every day remind me how many stars are on the Texas flag. <laughs> One. <laughs> and they tell me every day. I haven't got used to driving yet. But I, w I was certain that things were going to be a lot different even in like the church community. And I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about the church community at large. Like other Christians and other churches and other pastors that I've gotten a chance to get to know. But really, it's really not that different. And I've been quite shocked that it, it, it's not as different as I thought it would be. Like, we're still up here having the same conversations that we were having down in Texas. And what I mean by that is every day, at least every week, I'm having conversations with people about contemporary worship style versus traditional worship style. And I'm having conversations with people about hymns or modern worship music, which, by the way, I don't even know when a modern worship song becomes a hymn. How old does it have to be to become a hymn? Like 95 years when it becomes public domain? See, that's a serious question. I don't even know when the transition shifts over. We talk about dress code. We talk about whether or not it's sinful that I'm wearing jeans right now. We talk about whether or not it was sinful that Zach Mooney, a couple weeks ago when he played bass with me, wore a New York Yankees cap. <laughs> and I'm just going to go ahead and address that one. Yes, that was sinful. I don't know how any born-again believer is going to be wearing a New York Yankees cap. It should have been a Texas Rangers cap. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. We get into conversations about the roles of elders and deacons and pastors and how many points of Calvinism are right or wrong. And we get into all these theological debates. And for me, the one that I struggle with is like I'll get into these like biblical prophecy conversations with my sister for like hours, just wasting time being like, well, if Ezekiel 38 means this, then it, we match that with Revelation 13, just speculating and guessing and working myself up and getting scared. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh no, this is it. 
He's coming today. You know, I mean, that, those are the kind of conversations that we fall into. We talk about the roles between a husband and a wife. When should people get married? What's too young? What's too old? When should we start a family? When should we have kids? You know, there's a lady, a young lady in this church, in this church, who serves faithfully here and sometimes at other places. And she told me a couple weeks ago, sometimes I would rather hang out with my non-believing friends because they don't put pressure on me to get married. And I'm like, what? What? I've got two friends in Texas, Jason and Jocelyn, Jocelyn Fleming, two of my closest friends. I worked with Jocelyn for a long time at the first church that I ever worked at, New Beginnings Church in Longview, Texas. Pastor Todd Connitz gave me my first break, so shout out to that guy. And Jason ended up being in one of the bands that I jammed in down there. And they waited until they were almost 30 years old to get married. And more than that, they didn't have sex with each other or with anyone else. And the question I ask is, what honors God more? Does it honor God more that they waited for him to bring the right person into their life before they got married? Or would it have honored God more for them to just jump into a marriage at 23 years old because that's the societal norm? Or more than that, just be sleeping around with everybody because it feels good and our culture says that that's okay. What honors God more? That's the question that I have to ask. More conversations that we get into. We'll talk about this church over here. We'll talk about that church over there. I don't like the carpet there. I don't like the guy who preaches over here, but I like the music over here, so I'm going to go over here on the music, and if I can sneak out, I can get over to this church and listen to this guy preach because I like him. And we're having all these conversations just going back and forth, or I don't go to that church because they hurt my feelings. And can I just time out? I just want to time out for a second from preaching. I'm going to set that right here, and I'm going to step over into a pastoral role for a second and tell you, if you've been hurt by the church, this church or any other church, I'm sorry that that happened to you. I'm sorry that the church has so many black eyes. I'm sorry that the church has so many busted lips and bloody noses. But I think I can speak for Pastor Greg and Pastor Matt and Pastor Conrad and every elder here and let you know that we know what that feels like. We know what it feels like to be hurt by the church. And we want to help you be able to process that if we can. We, any of us would be glad to sit down with you and have a talk and let's just work through that. Okay? I was hurt by the church deep. Probably the biggest pain in my adult life came from the church. To the point where I was, I remember saying this prayer, God, I've got you, and I've got my family, and that's all I need. I'm done with all that. I don't need accountability. I don't need friendship. I don't need community. I'm walking away from that. I'm going to go work at UPS and make bank, because that's what I was doing before I did this. <laughs> and I, they probably would have taken me back, probably. <laughs> anyway. So I'm stepping back over here. I'm going to get back into preaching. We have all these conversations that are good conversations to have. But at the end of the day, they're secondary conversations. And at the end of the day, some of the things that we spend our time talking about are so far down the list that they're not even numbered anymore. You know what I'm saying? Are you following me? You may be sitting out there thinking, he's mean. He's just bitter. He's just bitter toward the church. And that's not the case. I'm not bitter toward the church. I'm a pastor. How weird would that be? Hey, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, but I hate the church. <laughs> I'm not saying this stuff because I'm bitter at the church. I'm saying this stuff because I love the church. I love the church. Why do I love the church? Because the church is flawed and is bruised and is messed up as we are as the bride of Christ. And Jesus Christ loves his church. And we are the ones within the church who have a tendency to walk away. The old hymn, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's us, not him. But I do think that there's some practical ways that we can honor him. And that's by keeping what needs to be of first importance of first importance. And that's what we're going to look at today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting in verse 1. 
Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Everything else gets pushed off the table right here. Everything. All these other conversations that we have go out the window when we read that passage. We know from Acts chapter 18 that Paul spent a year and a half with the Corinthian church teaching the word of God to them. And he spent a year and a half preaching what we call today the gospel. And they received it. And they were standing in it. But apparently there had risen a belief among some of the people in the Corinthian church that there was no resurrection from the dead. And Paul actually spends the entire rest of chapter 15 telling them that, yes, there is indeed a resurrection from the dead, but we're gonna have to, you guys will have to look into that one on your own because that's not where I'm going. My point today is that even the early church is getting sidetracked on all these other conversations that are not the main focus and should not be the main focus of the Christian life. It's a fact that when we're believers, we still wage war with the old man right? Anybody feel that every day? The battle against sin, we're never going to see clearly, fully, until we get to heaven. Everything that we see is veiled right now. But Jesus will redeem us one day. But we can see clearer and not walk around our lives just bumbling and trying to just make it if we focus on what is the main thing. And Paul is telling us right here in this passage, listen to what he says. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. He's saying to us, of all the things that I've ever written, this is what you can't mess up. Paul wrote 50% of the New Testament. And he says, everything that I've ever preached, everything that I've ever said, you cannot mess this up. It has to stay in its proper place. If it's not in its proper place, everything else in your life is going to be skewed. And what does he say? He's saying we can have conversations that hopefully are fruitful, and we can have open and honest, and Conrad likes to say robust dialogue, which I think is pretty cool because I like that word, robust. And we can study the scriptures together, and we can do word studies, and we can sharpen one another. But Paul's saying, do not mess this up. I'm delivering this to you of first importance. This is the most important thing. And what does he say? That Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's what we call the gospel, and that's what the Christian life is all about. It's not about any of that other stuff. This is what it's about. The gospel is about Jesus Christ penetrating even the hardest heart and people experiencing life change because of it. That's what the Christian life is all about. We can't miss that. The gospel, that word means good news. Why is it good news? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) The gospel's good news because it addresses the terrible news. And what's the terrible news? That we're sinners. Me, you, all y'all, all all y'all, all all of us are sinners. And that's bad news. Why? Because sin separates us from fellowship with the living God. And we are by nature children of wrath. And we deserve the full outpouring of his wrath onto us. Every one of us. Listen what John Piper, my most favorite living theologian. Listen to this definition of sin. Sin is any feeling or thought or speech or action that comes from a heart that does not treasure God over all things. Sinning, sins, actions called sins, are any thought feeling, action, or speech that come like fruit, branch, or shoot out of the root of the heart that prefers anything to God. This is terrible news. Terrible news. But Paul is telling us that the terrible news is confronted by the good news of the gospel. That Jesus Christ died for our sins was buried and was raised on the third day. And then we can come to him in our sinful state, regardless of a despicable past, right here, 
And we can go to him and we can put our love and our treasure into the treasure that he is and be raised from spiritual death to spiritual life with the promise and hope of everlasting life with him one day. The good news of the gospel is what the Christian life is all about. And we can't lose focus of that. In the Old Testament, there was a system set in place by God for the forgiveness of sins where every year on the Day of Atonement they would bring two lambs. One of them would get its throat sliced and bled out. The other one would get prayed over and it would symbolically bear the sins of the people of Israel. And they would send it off into the wilderness as the scapegoat and it would carry their sins away for a year. And they did this year after year after year after year for the forgiveness of sins. But then God shows up in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ, and he lived a perfect life that we often overlook. We often overlook the perfect life that Jesus lived. Think about that for a second. Jesus Christ never sinned. He never sinned. He never hated anyone in his heart. He never lusted. He never lied. He never murdered anyone in his heart. He lived the, a perfect life. Man, he had siblings. Like, every time I see my sister, I just want to kick her in the face. <laughs> and she's like 40. <laughs> Seriously. But every time I see her, I just want to just like, hmm, I just don't like you. Is there anything I can do about it? No, it's just your face. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus lived a perfect life on our behalf that he might be offered as a spotless sacrificial lamb drained of all his blood on a cross, and then carry away our sins, carry away the sins of the world. We can't, we can't lose sight of that. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So as a reminder, as we go into the new year, what is of first importance in the Christian life? The sacrificial ransoming cross of Jesus Christ. The gospel has to be the main focus because the gospel is the only thing that has the power to change lives. Ezekiel, he foretold of the promise of the gospel in chapter 36 of his book, verses 26 and 27. That's what he says. God says to the prophet Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So let me sum the gospel up. When someone gives their life to Jesus Christ, he puts the heart of flesh in he takes the heart of stone out. He puts his spirit in and he shakes it all about. <laughs> now you're a new creation and he turns your life around. That's what it's all about. Sing it with me. He puts the heart of flesh in. He takes the heart of stone out. He puts his spirit in and he shakes it all about. You're a new creation and he turns your life around. Come on. You got it. You got it. We can't lose focus of that. We can't lose focus of that as we go into 2019. And I'm glad we can have a little bit of fun with that. But do you guys see where I'm going here? That's the challenge for us. As we go into the new year, how silly do we look as Christians arguing about the color of my boots? Think about it. We have eternal life-giving news to deliver to a world that is dying and going to hell. And they're going to spend eternity separated from Jesus Christ. And here we are just having conversations. And I'm going to use myself as an example. Me and my sister, like a few years ago, we, had, we knew who the Antichrist was. That, that, that's how much we get into that. 
We get sidetracked on all these random conversations and we lose our focus on what the Christian life is all about. But it's hard, right? It's hard to remember that. And I'm not preaching at you guys. I'm saying for all of us, that's a hard thing to remember. But God gives us some help and some tips on how we can do that. And I think the book of Daniel is very significant in helping us keep the gospel in its proper place as we go through 2019. So just a little backstory. Anybody, you've heard of Daniel, right? So Daniel's this Israelite chap, and I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that's not Texas, that's like Great Britain. Um, <laughs> So he's this Israelite, and he's got three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? And there's this king named Nebuchadnezzar, and he's like going from country to country looking for world domination, and he's clearing house and taking names, okay? And so he takes Daniel and his buddies into captivity, and they're slaves. And so I say that that is, is an important book to help us because the country that they took Daniel and his friends to was called Babylon. And we live in a type of Babylon. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I love the United States of America. I'm patriotic to the core. I mean, just like, just like the rest of you. So I'm not like saying, oh, America. No, 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 I don't want to live anywhere else. So let's just not go there. But when we look at Babylon, let's just look at a few of the characteristics of Babylon. They had unparalleled material prosperity. They had the most powerful head of state in the world. They had a belief that the power of government was the solution to all of their problems. Tolerance for worshipers of the true God, the one that we worship, was only acceptable within like these parameters that they set in place. There was rampant sin there was social immersion and carnal things. There was addiction, and the list could go on and on. Think about that for a second. That sounds an awful lot like the United States. And on top of that, we are also captives in the United States. We're aliens here. If you're a believer, our citizenship is in heaven. This is, a, this is just a hut for us, but it's not home. It's not home. So we can kind of see the parallel between Daniel and his friends and us. And having said that, we can approach the writings of the book of Daniel with a new perspective. Because in the midst of all that was going on, the curtains pulled back just a little bit for us to be able to peek in and see why Daniel was the man that he was later proven to be. What, what, what is Daniel most famous for? The lion's den, right? And everybody knows that story. You don't pray, you don't worship God. And Daniel's like, not only am I going to pray, I'm going to the window. <laughs> You're going to watch me do it. Throw him into a lion's den, and he boldly faces death. But an angel shuts the mouth of the lions, and Daniel lives. And his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's the story behind that one? What are they most famous for? Fiery furnace, right? So this king, Nebuchadnezzar, builds this golden image and says, I've got a decree. When you hear some music play, you have to bow down and worship this image. If you don't, I'm going to burn you to death. That's intense. And they knew that they weren't going to worship this image of gold. And they were thrown into a fiery furnace. And what happened? God delivered them. He delivered them from it. But they just didn't wake up one day and say, huh, if I get thrown into a fiery furnace, it's good. I'm just going to walk into it like a boss. That's good. Throw me in. No, 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 no. We can get a glimpse as to what caused that in them. Let's look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. You're probably like, how does that help me? Well, let me tell you. Some translations read, but Daniel resolved that he wouldn't defile himself. 
But I like this translation because I think that purpose of heart is stronger language than a resolution. Who's made a New Year's resolution? Who's ever made one? Who's ever failed? More hands went up when I said who's failed than I actually confessed to making them. I make one every year. I'll be honest with you. Mine, every single year, every New Year's Eve, I'm like, new year, new me. (laughs) And I tell my wife, I'm like, babe, guess what I'm not going to do next year? Fly off the handle about dumb stuff. And she does exactly that. She laughs at me. (laughs) Because, you know, that's one of the things that I struggle with. And I don't know why, but from time to time, I just blow up. I'm just like a balloon that just like a nothing, a little tack that is nothing, just makes me explode. I come home from work. Hey, kids, how are you? My son's like, Daddy, can I get something on the Xbox? And I'm like, no, get away from me. You know, just (laughs) like mean. Like, he's not doing anything other than a 12-year-old boy does, and I'm just like, boom, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a struggle, and I'm going to try to work through it. But we all make resolutions, and most of the time they fail because there's something stronger than a resolution, and that's to have purpose of heart. And I've got a definition that I came up with with the help of my dad for purpose of heart. I looked it up on dictionary.com, and I couldn't find one, so I made one up. Purpose of heart is the determination that grows from within us that tells us a line must be drawn. It's the innate, innate, undeniable impulse to say or do what is right without regard to whether it is all right. It's the drive to live by the will of God with or without the permission of those standing about, and it's the courage and confidence instilled by the Spirit of the living God to be as He is in this world. You know, it doesn't take a great deal of purpose of heart to get on Facebook and rant. It doesn't take a great deal of purpose of heart to retweet an inspiring quote. I do that all the time. Like, ooh, Piper tweeted something, retweet. It doesn't take a great deal of purpose of heart to rant On social media, it doesn't take a great deal of purpose of heart to jump on a bandwagon when conversations turn to one of the hundreds of hot topics that are going on in our culture right now, but it does require purpose of heart to lovingly and gently, yet boldly and confidently refuse to be like the world. To choose in the moment to be different, even if you're different alone. It takes a lot to rise above status quo religion and consistently seek the face of the living God and to live your life filtering everything through the lens of the gospel, keeping it of first importance. And I think this is probably a good place for the takeaway. I struggled with where to put this last night. Life becomes clearer when you focus on the gospel. Life becomes clearer when we focus on the gospel. In later chapters of the book of Daniel, as we've already talked about, we'll see that he risked his life for the honor of his God. But it didn't just start that way. It began with purpose of heart. If we're going to be a light for Christ in this world, we will need that same purpose of heart. If we're going to keep the gospel focused as we walk through 2019, we're going to need that same purpose of heart. We're going to need the same purpose of heart that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had when they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your image of gold. Settle in your heart today. We have to settle it in our hearts today. Ask the Lord to strengthen you with purpose of heart so that you can keep the gospel of first importance as we go into the new year. Most of us in this room will probably never be asked to lay our life down for our faith. And part of me thinks that might be easier. Part of me feels like if somebody kicks that door in right now, waving a gun around saying, renounce your faith or die, I'd be able to say, let it rain down upon me. Because I believe in that moment that Jesus Christ would be with me just like he was with John the Baptist when he was beheaded, just like he was with Paul when he was murdered, just like he's been with every martyr who has ever laid down their life for what they know to be true. 
But it's harder to live it out. It's harder to live it out every day. Purpose of heart comes from the little things in life. For Daniel, it was not drinking wine or eating the king's delicacies. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was deciding that I'm not going to bow down to an image no matter what it costs me. For Daniel, it was, I'm going to continue to pray to my God, and I'm going to do it in the window like I always have, no matter what happens. Those are little things. They weren't even faced with death yet. Purpose of heart comes with the little things in our lives. Guys, dads, husbands, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when you're at your kid's soccer game and that mom that's like 40 but don't look like she's 40 walks past (laughs) and all your buddies are talking about what they'd like to do to her? What are you going to do? You're not just going to stand and not jump into that conversation with them if you don't have purpose of heart, if you haven't settled in your heart now that you're not going to engage in that kind of behavior. Moms, what are you going to do when that same lady walks by and all the other moms are gossiping about her? They've never even got a chance to go talk to her, get to know her, or shine the light of Christ in her life. What are you going to do? You're going to jump in and you're going to gossip with them unless you decide and purpose in your heart right now that you will not live like that. And don't think that I forgot you teenagers. <laughs> I got a teenage daughter. So this is probably the most important. What are you going to do when you wind up in the back seat of a car with your boyfriend or girlfriend and your hormones are raging, you're going to give in. If you haven't purposed in your heart now that you're just not going to end up in the back seat. That's what I tell my daughter all the time. The best way to not have to make that decision is to not end up in the back seat in the first place. We have to purpose these things in our heart today or sin will chew us up and spit us out and leave us ineffective for the gospel and it will not be of first importance in our life. And we'll continue to engage in gossip and we'll continue to engage in slander and we'll continue to be emotionally unhealthy and not trying to fix anything or make anything right or look for restoration and we'll just be happy just living like in this depression funk that we get in. The gospel has the power to change your life. The gospel restores marriages. The gospel fixes heartache. The gospel makes people alive. And it has to remain of first importance as we go through the new year. And that's a challenge today. I don't want us to just say, new year, new me. I want us as a church to pray together. Lord, give us the same purpose of heart that you gave Daniel, that we can live our life shining the light of Christ in every situation. And I'm not being silly about it. I'm not saying stand at the toothpaste aisle and say, Lord, should I get cinnamon or mint? I mean, seriously, come on. I think that God just cares that you're concerned about your oral hygiene. I don't think he cares what flavor toothpaste you get. I mean, I'm not being silly about it. I'm talking about when we walk through our life knowing, and we all agreed, that there's that battle between the old man and the new man. What are we going to do? You have to give it over every day, and it takes purpose of heart. Jesus says, if anyone want to be my disciple, he must take up his cross, when? Daily, and follow me. You know what happens on a cross? Death. When you take up your cross, you decide to die in that moment. And it's every day. We have to have that purpose of heart. If this church, if you individually, if any of us as Christians are going to be effective in shining a light for the gospel. John 12, 25, Jesus says, whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And I'm just praying as we go through the new year that God would give us the purpose of heart like like he gave Daniel. Daniel.